You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. I have uh, Mark Brettler. He's a member of the American Academy for Jewish Research and the Council of the Society of Biblical Literature. Uh, he's a distinguished professor of Jewish studies, Duke University, and religious studies. Many, many accolades, and we're going to talk today about the Jewish Bible and perhaps the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, Mark, thank you for coming. It's really my pleasure. If you would, tell me a bit about your current research and your specialization. Sure. So I'm doing a couple of things at this point. Um, my main area of specialization is the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament or the Jewish Bible. It goes by all sorts of names. I'll be using them more or less interchangeably. I'm doing some work now on the book of Psalms, one of the books of the Bible, and trying to understand both what it meant originally and what it has come to mean over time in Jewish, Christian, and secular understandings. I've also become very interested in the history of biblical scholarship. So I'm curious about different methods of interpretation that have been used, especially methods that have been used over the last few centuries. So very broadly, those are the sorts of things I'm working on now. Okay, and you said the book of Psalms, and I guess that was uh, supposed to have been written by King David exclusively, or how many authors? Uh, that's a great question. Well, it depends who you ask. If you ask most people who are part of either the Jewish or Christian religious tradition, they'll say that all 150 chapters were written by King David. If you look at the Bible itself, the book of Psalms, very often the chapter begins with what we call a superscription, namely a title of sorts. If I remember my statistics correctly, and I'm sure someone in the podcast will correct me, about 73 of those have the word the David of David. And we're not even sure that in the Hebrew, those are meant to mean that these were written by David. They could equally, in terms of the translation of the Hebrew, mean in the style of David or for David or something like that. But religious traditions have usually taken them to mean by David and have extended that from about half of the Psalter to the entire Psalter. Even though if you take a good look, there are quite a few Psalms that are attributed to people other than David. Uh, modern biblical scholarship, as is often the case, differs quite considerably from what the traditional perspective is. And as a modern biblical scholar, I don't think that any of these are by King David. In fact, I'm not even quite positive that King David was a historical figure. We could leave that aside. But one of the reasons I don't think any of the Psalms are by King David is we have a good sense of how the history of the Hebrew language developed. And King David was supposed to live in the 10th century or so. And this is simply not what 10th century Hebrew would have looked like. So maybe, maybe, maybe someone could claim, oh, yeah, the original form was by King David, but they've been updated. But claiming that in their current form, they're by King David would be like taking a page out of you know, a con newspaper from 2022 and to say, oh, yeah, this was clearly written by William Shakespeare even though contemporary newspaper will obviously have very, very different language than King, uh, than what Shakespeare would have. Quick question here. So what are some of the names of the types or forms of Hebrew that have existed, you know, for thousands of years? What is it called? Like I've heard of like Queen Greek, but I don't know the names of you know, different versions of Hebrew that are older. Yeah. Yeah. So Koine Greek is simply a common Greek which was a Greek that was spoken at the time of Jesus. And again, different types of Greek were spoken at different times in different places. And this is totally typical of all languages, which change over time and over geographical areas. So what most people believe in terms of the history of the Hebrew language is that you could speak of three main periods of biblical Hebrew. The first period is what is called archaic Hebrew, and we find that only in certain biblical poems. So people speak of archaic biblical poetry 
You see this, for example, in the Song of the Sea in Exodus chapter 15. You see it in Deborah's song in Judges chapter 5, and in a few other fragments here or there. So even to a person who knows Hebrew, well, biblical Hebrew relatively well, this Hebrew sounds strange. It's like a contemporary person reading Shakespeare with all the these and thys and so forth. Then there is what is called classical biblical Hebrew. But in terms of understanding the periodization of biblical Hebrew, it is important to remember that the Judeans were exiled to Babylonia first in the year 597, some of them, and then 11 years later, more were exiled in the year 586. And the main language at that point in Babylonia was Aramaic, which is a cousin of Hebrew. And at that point, Aramaic started to have a great deal of influence on biblical Hebrew. So people speak of classical biblical Hebrew in terms of the Hebrew before the Babylonian exile, and then use the term late biblical Hebrew for Hebrew, perhaps in the Babylonian exile, but certainly after the Jews returned from the Babylonian exile, starting in the year 538 BC or BCE. So again, this is natural. So for example, English in Texas is going to sound different than English in North Dakota, simply because of the country that each of those states is next to. So language changes over time, language changes over geography. And again, one of the reasons, many reasons for reading and appreciating the Bible in the original Hebrew is these are the sorts of things that you could see only in the original. Translation tends to obscure all of these dialectical differences. Yeah, that makes sense. What what was the name or form of Hebrew that was the last one before it kind of went to extinct for? Well, we, we're never quite years. sure. That's a good, I appreciate the way you phrase that. So that's typically called the late biblical Hebrew. But uh, late biblical Hebrew would transition then to the Hebrew that was spoken at the time of Jesus and earlier, and into rabbinic Hebrew, the Hebrew in which many of the books of rabbinic literature were written in. Some of those were written in Hebrew, some of those were written in Aramaic as well. And Hebrew eventually went extinct as a significant spoken language, but certainly existed as a written language throughout all of Jewish history. And in fact, even to some small extent as a spoken language. So for example, in the Middle Ages, when Jews from very different um, parts of the world would try to communicate with each other, let's say Jews from North Africa and Jews from uh, Europe, they would often try to communicate in some sort of Hebrew, even though it was a Hebrew which is largely based on their knowledge of scripture. So it never quite went distinct. Some people thought that Hebrew did go distinct, did become extinct in the early years of the first millennium, in other words, around the time of Jesus or a little bit later. But we, but archaeologists have found, for example, letters from the second century of the common era, which are written in Hebrew, which is a very good indication that Hebrew did not go entirely extinct until several centuries later. But again, not entirely, more or less extinct until several centuries later. Well, did the the use and reading and worship of the Old Testament itself keep, you know, the Hebrew language alive? Was that the, I guess, the pilot light that kept it going, at least in some form throughout the you know, thousands of years? Yeah, I like your image as a pilot light. It certainly did. Yes. Hmm, interesting. I guess it'd be weird to uh, to read a language for so long, but no one really to formally speak it. But again, still they could read it. They would have had to as they as they read the Bible. I guess they'd have to sound it out in their mind, the reader. Oh, they certainly speak it aloud. Oh, them. yeah. I mean, they first of all, it's important to realize that until the Renaissance, almost all reading was reading out loud. And there's all sorts of evidence before the Renaissance that when people were reading things silently was frowned down upon or sometimes seen negatively as some sort of magical experience. But it's, it's important to realize that the Torah, the first part of the Hebrew Bible, is read liturgically every Sabbath, every Shabbat in synagogue. And 
to the extent that people were literate, they would have been following along with books. So hearing Hebrew was definitely part of the every week Jewish liturgical experience. And almost all the prayers are in Hebrew as well. So this is something that people would have been familiar with. Maybe a good analogy, a partial analogy, may be the status of Latin in the Western Church before Vatican II, where many people had some you know, vague familiarity with Latin if they were Catholic as a result of the Mass being in Latin. But I think in Judaism, again, this is where this analogy may break down. The Mass, as far as I understand, was more or less the same every week. In the case of Judaism, every week you would be hearing a new section of the Torah. So that would, you're really hearing a lot of Hebrew, and you would have been, to the extent that you were following along, uh, increasing your literacy in Hebrew. And just one more comment about following along and understanding is there was a tradition which still continues in a small number of Jewish communities of reading the Torah in Hebrew and reading a translation of it in a different language in between. So that if you're hearing the Hebrew, then hearing it in another language, that really would have increased your proficiency, at least in understanding the Hebrew, if not necessarily being able to speak it. So I think, and I, I so much appreciate that you're asking and spending so much time about this, because it really does reflect the importance of Hebrew, even in an ongoing way within the Jewish community, which is really very different. There's nothing quite comparable to that, at least in Western Christianity after Vatican II. So what happened to Judaism during the time that there was no real active Hebrew spoken, or barely any, that was just confined to Again, the, the, you know, the Torah or the, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I mean, Judaism continued to develop. People continued to be able to at least understand the Bible. And like any religion, it developed as a result of internal factors. And it also developed as a result of the relation it had with the different countries that hosted it. So Judaism can changed. Judaism continues to change. And I would argue more broadly about religion. As some religious traditions claim, oh, you know, give me that old time religion. We have never changed. But all religions change over time. And so mm. that includes Judaism as well. But I wonder, would people pray in Hebrew? Or would they pray in their language? And the only time they would encounter Hebrew is in, you know, once a week when it would be read to them. Um, you know, their daily interactions probably wouldn't be in Hebrew. Again, their prayers wouldn't be in Hebrew. So like the way they experience their culture would be, ironically, I guess, in, in different languages instead of Hebrew. So it's just kind of a strange, I don't know how to put it, but it just, it, I just get an odd feeling. I just wonder what happened to the faith over the hundreds of years, that uh, thousands of years that this happened. The Hebrew remained important. It wasn't only a Saturday thing. Uh, within traditional Judaism, people pray three times a day. And um, I can make up a statistic of you know, 98.3% of those prayers are in Hebrew within traditional Judaism. So Hebrew would have really been kept alive on an ongoing basis in traditional communities. Okay. So going back to your studies, how do you study something so old? How do you study the book of Psalms? Like, you know, Did you have to search for the absolute oldest versions of it that you could find, or what did you use as your reference material? Yeah, this is, that's a great, another wonderful question. So there are lots of different steps to uh, studying a text if you are a biblical scholar. So given the way you ask the question, the first step is really deciding which text you're going to study. So even though there is a standard text of the Bible that is used within Judaism and you know, Protestants and Catholics more or less accept that standard Hebrew text. Uh, we know, especially since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which started to be talked about in the year 1947, that the Hebrew text that we have was not the only Hebrew text in circulation, and that at points there are problems with the Hebrew text that we now have. 
And also then in some cases, some very, very ancient translations. So for example, the Bible started to be translated into Greek in the third pre-Christian century in a translation that is called the Septuagint. And very often the Septuagint has a different translation than what the main Hebrew text is. People used to say, oh, or some people used to say, that's because the Septuagint was a bad or tendentious or a false translation. But now that the Dead Sea Scrolls have discovered, have been discovered, in some cases, the Greek translation is not the same as the standard Hebrew text, but is the same as one of the texts that you have from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are ancient Hebrew texts. So the first thing that I'm going to need to do if I study a psalm is to figure out exactly what text of the psalm I'm going to study. And by the way, many people don't realize this, but we have these issues in modernity as well. We don't have autographs of Shakespeare's plays. And in some cases, we have very different early versions of those plays. And if you're going to want to understand how to interpret Hamlet or Macbeth, One of the things that you need to decide is which text of Hamlet or Macbeth do you want to study? That is a whole subset of biblical studies, which is called textual criticism. So the first thing is, I'll decide what text I want to interpret. Then using a variety of tools, I'm going to try my hardest to understand the Hebrew as well as I can. And I'm going to build up from words to sentences. And within Psalms, I'm sorry, all the Psalms are poetic. And one of the things that characterizes biblical poetry, which makes it so hard for so many people, because it's so very different than most contemporary poetry, perhaps even all contemporary poetry that I know of, it has a phenomenon which is called parallelism where almost every line or verse can be divided into two parts, where the first and second part are closely related, both in terms of syntax and in terms of word choice. So, for example, from Psalm 121, just say, recite the Hebrew, so the listeners can hear some Hebrew, then translate it. Yomam Hashem Eshlo Yakeka V'yareach Balayla. By day, the sun shall not smite you, nor the moon by night. So there you can hear their word pairs, sun, moon, day, night. And you could hear that the verse divides very neatly into two parts. So after I understand the words, I'm going to look at the longer line, which will typically be divided into two parts. And then I'll see how meaning is created by those two parts interacting with each other. And then from there, I'll see how the lines or verses get strung together into units. The Bible is not really big into stanzas, although in some cases, Psalms do have stanzas. But again, one of those things that many people don't realize is that translators often make certain moves which are not in the original Hebrew. So stanzas are typically marked in English Bibles by white space in between verses. But in Psalms, you typically do not have those white spaces. So that is an interpretive call of dividing a larger psalm into smaller subunits. But I will see if a psalm, if it makes sense to divide a psalm in that particular way. And then I'll take a look at the psalm as a whole. And there I'll look for literary features. I'll be curious about how the psalm might have been used in the temple, because most people, scholars think that many of the psalms, or perhaps even most of the psalms, originated in the liturgy of the temple in Jerusalem. And when relevant, I will see how a particular Israelite psalm is related to thematically or in terms of vocabulary to other psalms from the ancient world, or more specifically, the ancient Near Eastern world, because one of the things that we know, and there are clear cases of this in the Bible, one of the things that we know is that prayers traveled from one country to another country, and sometimes even the name of a deity of a particular place 
would have been changed in ancient Israel and replaced with the name of Israel's God. So those are an initial set of questions I will ask. And then going back to the introduction, uh, I've gotten more and more curious, not only about what the psalm originally meant, which is what biblical scholars have spent most of their time on until recently, but I'll now also ask, you know, how was this psalm understood in different times in history? How did it come to be reinterpreted or reappropriated? So, a quick question here. So, the psalms were they written in a poetic form? Like, I'm just making iambic pentameter. Were they written in any formalized structure, or what was their structure? Or are they are they all over the place? Do they have different forms? They have different forms. None of them is in iambic pentameter. So when we think about poetry in the uh, Western tradition, we think of poetry as having two main features, rhythm and end rhyme. Biblical poetry does not have end rhyme or very, very rarely has end rhyme. Uh, if meter means, since you mentioned iambic pentameter, every line having the same number of syllables and there being a pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables for every line, you know, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. I'm going to mess it up here. And once upon a midnight dreary bum, ba dum, ba dum, ba dum, bum, and so forth, where you have the same structure of of stressed and unstressed syllables, the Bible doesn't have that. It may have a quasi-meter to the extent that some, but not all psalms have lines of more or less the same length and perhaps more or less, more or less the same number of syllables. But instead, this is going to sound like a bit of a tautology, I like calling or characterizing poetry as that which is not prose. And different cultures use this type of non-prose elevated language in different situations and are non-prosy in different ways. So since you mentioned, I think, I, I am the iambic pentameter, uh, that's, if I started speaking in iambic pentameter, uh, you and your whole audience would think I'm a little bit strange because th that's okay. not the way people speak prose. In ancient Hebrew, the equivalent of iambic pentameter is this phenomenon I discussed earlier of parallelism, where most verses divide neatly into two parts. And in one way or another, and there are a variety of different ways, the second part of the verse seconds or repeats or heightens the first part of the verse. And that is the manner in which mm. biblical poetry is non-prosy. Let me just give an example. Perhaps I'll take the most beloved of Psalms, which I imagine to be Psalm 23. So you could hear the first verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I still love that old King James translation. You could hear how it divides neatly into two parts. In the Hebrew, those two parts are more or less the same length. Adonai ro'i, lo echsar. But the second verse is really a great way of illustrating a particular type of parallelism, often called synonymous parallelism. Again, I'll just let you hear the Hebrew. And if you listen carefully, you'll, you'll hear certain repetitions between the first and the second part, which really reflect similarities of grammatical structure or parallelism between those two parts. And then when I'll read you the English, you'll hear how the second part of the verse repeats in different language the first part of the verse. The Hebrew Bin Otadesha Yarbit Saini Al Meminuchot Yinahaleni. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me to water in places of repose. So you could hear the internal repetition. And if I started to speak like that, 
if I talked like that now, if I said everything two times, if I repeated everything in that fashion, you would think I was crazy. You would believe that I was strange. So you just heard how I gave you three lines in biblical parallelism style in English and how non, how atypical it is of the way we typically speak prose. Yeah, I see what you mean. It has its own structure. It's not necessarily like the poetry of today, but it still has its own structure and rhythm and, and things like that. Yeah, and by um, the way, let me just say most poetry in the ancient Near Eastern world has this type of structure with this doubling and uh, often divided into two uh, lines, often divided into two parts. So Israel, this okay. is an ancient Israelite development. This is yet another of many, many cases where ancient Israelite culture, not surprisingly, is a part of the greater culture of the ancient Near East in which it developed and grew. Right. Um, Were any of these Psalms or other parts of the Bible written only to be spoken to others and some written to just be read between you and, again, you and God, essentially, or just to be read to yourself? Yeah. Uh, I don't think that they're really, you know, silent. Any Psalms that are silent, meditative devotion, if that's what you're asking. I think most of the Psalms are recited to God, but you run into a problem with the book of Psalms. So I'll give you two illustrations. Psalm 23 illustrates that problem because note the beginning, unlike the end of Psalm 23, God is spoken of in the third person rather than in the second person, right? It's not, O oh Lord, you are my shepherd, but the Lord is my shepherd. And in the next line, he makes me lie down in green pastures. So that you have a Psalms which speak of God rather than directly to God. And uh, let me give you another example from Psalm 114. When Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange speech. Again, I paused in the middle. You could hear the balance or the parallelism. Judah, um, Judah became his holy one. Israel, his dominion. Again, I maybe overemphasized the parallelism in my reading, but note how you twice have his not your. And one of the things that I've discovered about Psalms, which is something that I've written about that I'm working on more and more, and when we think about prayer, we usually think about it in terms of a vertical aspect, that we as individuals or as a community are, in quotes, speaking to God, asking God for some help, thanking God, etc., but a reasonable number of these psalms speak about God rather than to God. And I think that one of the function of prayer is to create communities where everybody is praying the same thing. And doctrine is often shared in prayer. Uh, you could think of this in terms of various confessions that you have within the Christian community where Notions of belief are discussed in prayer, and that is to create a horizontal relationship where a very famous priest said in the 20th century, those who pray together stay together. So again, going back to the beginning of my answer, I don't think you had much silent meditation, but you had prayer creating a community in the biblical period in the same way that I think you have that now as well. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. So who do you think wrote, what, what, who were some of the people that wrote the book of Psalms, or, or rather, why would they write it? What was the context of society at that time, and why do you think these were written? About who? Yeah, so let me start with your original question, because it's a question that I get asked a lot. And the basis of that question is really a very, very strong distinction between much of the ancient Near Eastern world and to some extent, the later Greek world and certainly the modern world, where authorship and description of a written work to one particular individual is very, very central. So we don't know 
we meaning biblical scholars, do not know the author of any psalm. Uh, these were originally written anonymously, and at some point in the tra- tradition, they became connected to David or to some other individual. So I think it's really important not to ask about the book of Psalms or about most biblical books, uh, who is the author, because that is a question which scholars are not going to be able to answer. In terms of the book of Psalms, what a few of the things that we know are as following. Number one, it is not a single book, but it really is a book which has grown over time. And you can see this because, for example, the end of Psalm 72 reads, end of the prayers of David, son of Jesse. Okay, but that's only not even halfway through the book of Psalms. Psalms has 150 chapters. And some of the later chapters, indeed, in their first verse or superscription, have the word Le David to David or of David or by David, however you might translate that. Now, some Psalms also, and here, you know, your own leisure, listeners, please open your Bibles and take a look at Psalm 14 and at Psalm 53. And you will see that those psalms are nearly identical. So sometimes a psalm might originate and somebody would riff off that psalm a little or naturally change over time. And in terms of your more specific question of how did they originate? When did they, when were they used? Most of the psalms probably originated. And here you could hear, I'm using the words most and probably. So I'm really hedging my bets were written for worship in the Jerusalem temple or in relation to the Jerusalem temple. More than a handful of Psalms talk about being outside of Jerusalem and wanting to get to the temple and the enemies preventing the person praying from getting to the temple. So most of the Psalms probably originated in the temple But at some point, I and many other scholars think that the Psalms became a book detached from the temple and its reality. And the way in which you see that is the very first Psalm, which functions as the introduction to the book of Psalms, says in the second verse, the teaching of the Lord is his delight. And he studies that teaching day and night. And although there's not universal agreement about this, most scholars think that the teaching that is referred to here is the book of Psalms. So at some point in the, in tradition, Psalms went from a book which was read in worship contexts to a book which could be studied, a book which could be meditated upon. Indeed, in both Jewish and Christian traditions, There are various customs of some people reading the book of Psalms every day, some people reading the book of Psalms over a one-week period, and there it has a meditative-like function. So it may have originated largely within the temple, but then it would have all sorts of different functions uh, in its afterlife. Hmm. I mean, what's your current conclusion about the book of Psalms? I know it's a very generic question, but before you started studying it in this way, I don't know, what have you realized about it that's different from when you first started? What what perception of it do you have of it now? Yeah, I'll say two things really change. Number one, I'll say three things change. Number one, I just realized what a difficult book it is. I mean, the Hebrew in places is very difficult. But number two, it is really quite beautiful. So I think sometimes you study something more and more and you like it less and less. Uh, I've come to appreciate the beauty of the book of Psalms more and more. And the other thing that I've appreciated more and more, and this came out in my answers to you earlier, is that I think a reasonable number of Psalms may not be connected to the temple and may have more of a function of creating an ancient group identity or a type of solidarity around the ideas of Psalms and that these are not purely 
prayers to God. And that explains why a fair number of them speak of God rather than uh, to God. And thus, they are not really prayers in the standard way of thinking. Because when most people think about prayers, by definition, a prayer needs to be to the deity rather than about the deity. Okay. The sources of information that you're using to study this, um, you know, how many different versions of the book of Psalms and, you know, what was the oldest one you found? You know, what are some of the, the interesting, I guess, draft notes of your journey to study this book that you can talk about? Well, what I do when I study a psalm is, again, I'll first look at the most ancient versions, which uh, may be the Dead Sea Scrolls or maybe the ancient Greek translation, the Septuagint. And then I will try to read as much of the history of the interpretation of the psalm as possible. So even though a modern biblical scholarship, what is often called historical critical scholarship, has its own set of rules for how the Bible should be understood, often pre-modern scholarship offers useful sorts of insights or interesting interpretations. And I just read as much as I can. You know, I actually recently reorganized my library, so I must have a good you know, 30, 40 different commentaries on the Book of Psalms, when I work on each psalm, I will read through each commentary, tens of other books on psalms. You know, I'll read, I'll process, I'll give my mind a little bit of rest, and then I'll try to decide at least how I think what the psalm meant in its most original context, which as a, Bibli- as a pretty standard biblical scholar, if there is such a thing, is the main thing that, I'm in, that I am interested in. Although, as I said before, I have some subsidiary interests as well in how the psalm was interpreted over time. Yeah, how many different authors do you intuit there are in the book of Psalms? Ooh, like there are, well, here it really gets complicated because traditionally there are 150 psalms, uh, but life is complicated. Psalms 9 and 10 in the, ver- the account that we use were clearly one psalm originally. And the way we know this is because Psalms 9 and 10 together are what are called an acrostic or an alphabet psalm. And there are a few of these in the book of Psalms. Uh, you have this, for example, in Psalm both Psalm 111 and Psalm 112. You have this in Psalm 145 and some others where one verse starts with the equivalent of A, Aleph, next verse or a few verses later start with B, Bet, and so forth. And the acrostic there is spread over two psalms. So it's very clear that Psalms 9 and 10 originally were written as a single composition. And in some cases, a single chapter of Psalms uh, has more than two compositions in it. Or if you look, for example, at Psalm 137, the very famous by the rivers of Babylon. It looks like there is origin, there is an original psalm, which is the part that most people know. Then it looks like three verses were added or tacked on at the end as a type of supplement, different style, slightly different content and, and so forth. So I don't even know how many psalms there are. And I don't really know if some psalms were written by the same people. Uh, I think that stylistically, the amount of nuanced differentiation that we can make in biblical Hebrew is relatively small. And I don't think that I can really determine that you know, three psalms or five psalms or eight psalms were written by the same person. So I really have no idea how many different you know, hands or voices are reflected in the book of Psalms. Uh, I would guess more than, a, given that there are 150 chapters, you know, certainly more than 100. I think in some cases there may be Psalms that were written by the same person, but I don't think that there are many cases like that. Oh. Why are they in the order that they're in, you think? <laughs> like, who, who put this together and what do you think they're... That's yeah. a good, that, that, that's a, 
That's the question. I'm sorry, the reason I laughed that way is because if you asked that question 30 years ago, I, do, I would have been quite surprised by it. Because in anecdotes that people used to tell about the three consecutive books of Psalms, Proverbs, and Job, is that in Psalms, there is no connection between one chapter and the next. In Proverbs, at least in the middle section, where each verse is on a different topic, there's no connection between one verse and the preceding and following verse. And in Job, where the Hebrew is so very difficult, people used to say, there's no connection between one word and the next and previous word. But things have changed over the last few decades in the study of the book of Psalms. And some scholars, I'm actually not among them, have become very interested in the structure of Psalms, in whether the book of Psalms as a whole tells a particular um, message. So one thing that we do know about structure is that in some cases, Psalms which are very similar to each other are put next to each other, like Psalm 111 and 112 have uh, the same acrostic style, similar quasi-meter, and so forth. We also know that there are some collections. So, for example, Psalm 120 begins a collection of psalms, which in Hebrew has start, each one starts with the word or its equivalent, phrase or its equivalent, shir ha-ma'alot, a song of ascent, and that continues through Psalm 134. So sometimes there were eight, there were ancient collections which grouped psalms together. In terms of the mega structure of all 150 chapters, one of the things that has been suggested, I don't necessarily buy into it. I think this is more of an accident than an intentional editing, is that many psalms in the first part of the Psalter have pleas to God. They are what are called laments. And many of the psalms in the second half, or I'm sorry, they're called laments or petitions. Many of the psalms in the second half of the book of Psalter are hymns or thanksgivings, uh, songs of thanksgiving to God. And that's one of the things that people have suggested in terms of the broader structure of the book of Psalms is that there is a general movement from being in straits or distress with these laments or petitions to having been saved and therefore singing songs of thanksgiving or hymns to God. So people, some people see a structure of uh, positivity or redemption almost from the beginning to the end of the book of Psalms. I think that in broad strokes, that structure is there. I think it is very difficult to show that that structure is intentional and meaningful in the book. But your question of sort of looking for a structure in this large book is very much what some scholars in the last few decades have been trying to figure out. And do um do some or all the Psalms have a reference somewhere else in the Bible or a provenance from a different part of the Bible? Or do they seem to, I don't know, just be people's experiences with gods or thoughts about God as yeah. they go about their lives? Uh, so let me answer that question in a couple of different ways. I mean, some Psalms are mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, especially in one of the latest biblical books, which nobody reads, the book of Chronicles. You have some Psalms, we have more or less mashups of several Psalms, which appear in the book of Chronicles. These, what are called the superscriptions, these first verses in many Psalms often do connect the particular Psalms to episodes in the life of David. So, for example, Psalm 3, and by the way, in the English tradition, these superscriptions are often verse 0, because the psalm itself, verse 1, only starts with the poetic content of the psalm. In the Hebrew tradition, this would count as verse 1. But, for example, a lament or a petition in Psalm 3 begins, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. 
Now, again, most scholars think that these were these titles or superscriptions were not an original part of the psalm. But to return to your question, what these superscriptions do, thank you for the question because I've never thought about it quite in this way, is they anchor certain psalms within the book of Psalms, and thus the book of Psalms as a whole, more broadly into the Bible as a whole. And thus, when you have a psalm of David, when he fled from his son Absalom, that connects Psalm 3 to one of the later chapters in the, in the book of Samuel, in the book of Second Samuel. So those are the sorts of connections, most often in these title verses that you find within the Psalter. And the, the placement of the book of Psalms in its final form, like in time, where does it come in the Old Testament? Is it near the end or does it, does it span the entire length of time of all the books? Of the Old Testament, like, what do you think? Yeah, I think in terms of composition and history of composition, this is a book which spans at least 500 years and might even span a few more centuries than that. So in some sense, and some people talk about this, the book of Psalms is a microcosm of the Bible as a whole because it reflects such a range of ideas from such different periods and also from, from such different places. So some of the Psalms, like some of the other books of the Bible, were written in the land of Israel before the first temple was destroyed in the year 586. Some, like other sections of the Bible, were written in Babylonia, in the Babylonian exile after 586 and before 538 and reflect the angst of being in the exile. And some of them were written after the return from the exile. And by the way, most people don't realize this because they think about Psalm 137 by the rivers of Babylon is coming from the exilic period itself. But there you read in verse one, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat sat and wept as we thought of Zion. The word there, T-H-E-R-E, is very important because it implies in Psalm 137, verse 1, that the people who compose this or are praying this are no longer in Babylon, but have returned. And again, using linguistic and other evidence, there are a fair number of Psalms, especially in the last third of the Psalter, going back to one of your first questions, which are written in late biblical Hebrew, and thus were written after the return to Zion from Babylon in the year 538. So, you know, good 500 years. Okay. Well, very good. Mark, this has been a really great call. Where can people find out more about your work? Uh, sure. You can, you can look me up through Duke University if you just Google the Mark Brettler and Duke University. You'll certainly find out more about my work in some of the books I have written. If you're more, if you're more generally curious about the book of Psalms and indeed about the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible as a whole, I wrote a book called How to Read the Jewish Bible, which you, you might find helpful. And again, the best thing to do is to read the Bible. And I was involved in several publications of the Bible with notes. One of them is called the Jewish Study Bible. And indeed, many of my notes on the book of Psalms in the book of Psalms in the Jewish Study Bible are by me. And you, know, there's, you can't replace reading about something with reading something. So I would encourage everybody Oh, if you want to do it devotionally, that's fine. If you are not doing it intellectually because you're curious about the place of the Bible in America, how the Bible has changed over time, what the Bible originally meant, pick up any Bible that has notes. And you don't have to be Jewish to use the Jewish Study Bible, where my co-editor Adele Berlin and I, working with a team of people, have tried to explain many of the difficulties in the Bible, 
And the reason we do that is, you know, it's, it's an ancient book. Even in English translation, it's hard to read and understand. So I would really encourage those who are more interested to pick up that book or something like the new Oxford Annotated Bible, which offers brief notes uh, about what the Bible meant and continues to mean. Very good. Well, Mark, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Wonderful questions, Richard. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the good question podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the good question podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 